Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Koichi Kawasaki. I have to speak in English, but my English is not so good, so Sumiko-san will help me. Okay. Thank you for your invitation today. My name is Koichi Kawasaki, the Asahi um, Ashia City Museum of Art and History opened in 1989. I was involved with its opening and served as its chief curator of exhibitions and collection of Gutai works over the years. But my personal background with Gutai goes back much further to when I was still a student. Growing up in an environment where I became acquainted with the Gutai artists. When I began working for the Ashia Museum, I realized that my mission as its curator was to introduce Gutai to the world. After that, I worked at the Hyogo Prefectural Museum of Art and retired according to mandatory retirement age in 2013. Currently, I teach museology at a university and work as an independent curator. The idea of this two-person exhibition came about from a conversation with Mr. Alexander Carell, sitting right over there. This exhibition of Kazuo Shiraga, a most renowned artist, and Satoru Hoshino, an artist little known in New York, is an adventure. And why it is that these two artists are being shown together may be questioned. However, to me, it is necessary for the noteworthy artists in the generation following Shiraga to become known both in and outside of Japan. Among contemporary Japanese artists, there are many such exceptional artists with the capability to take on the world with their works. Regarding Shiraga, rather than have me speak of him, his work has been written about and given acclaim. I've watched Hoshino's work over time, but never thought of Shiraga influencing his work. I would like this exhibition as an opportunity to consider more deeply the physicality of contemporary art from the point of view of two artists who chose to work with mud. It opposes the use of tools in the creation of work taken for granted in this day and age. Mud is the matter closest to physicality. It was the first material Shiraga used in his first Gutai show in 1955. The two artists developed the expression of leaving natural traces of their bodies in the process of creating their work. And although this may imply a commonality, that may only be so through hindsight. How it came about has to do with their individuality and not a matter of direct influence. Learning from the works of predecessors is expected, but I do not believe that that promptly denotes influence. When speaking of the works of not only Shiraga and other Gutai artists and Jiro Yoshihara's Gutai Manifesto, I believe comparisons with something or another becomes necessary to explain Gutai and its artists from a pre-World War II historical context. The spirit of Gutai has yet been unequivocally explained. Although introductory texts to Gutai that are comparative from particular <coughs> perspectives have increased, I feel that a discussion on the spirit of Gutai has yet to be brought to the forefront. In Japan, at the height of their activities, they were criticized as having no content, no meaning in their work, playground of the rich. But if it had not been recognized at the time, it would not be receiving today's acclaim. 
In fact, could no meaning mean that it reached the furthest point possible in artistic expression? I think there is a need to construct an argument based on the background of Japan at the time, the lifestyle of Jiro Yoshihara, and the creative motivations behind each Gutai artist. Could the argument be established with premature one-sided arguments as they stand at the current time? There must be a fundamental understanding that can explain the spirit of Gutai. Despite the short time today, I, I hope it is the first day toward that understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. I'm um, David Raskin at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And in, in preparing for tonight's panel and in speaking with the panelists uh, earlier tonight, I realized in, in many ways I'm you know, kind of the ideal moderator because I'm a specialist in um, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, American and European post-World War II art. And so I, I know enough to be dangerously misinformed. So I spent the last hour uh, learning a tremendous amount about uh, Chiraga and Gutai and about, especially about how I really knew nothing about it. So I think they're going to have a lot to share with us tonight that will really help us gain a better understanding of the context. And one of the things that I couldn't help notice is, um, you know, with Chiraga being born in 1924, couldn't help notice that Joseph Boyce was born in 1921, that Soto downstairs was born in 1925, that Donald Judd is born in 1928, that Andy Warhol was born in 1928. So I had, yes, interesting, right? So I'd ask the panel, how come all of the years and all of this historiography, people want to tie Chiraga's work to somebody like Jackson Pollock or the abstract expressionist, artists who were born in, say, 1909, like Francis Bacon, 1912, like Jackson Pollock? And it turned out, it was really interesting to think about the difference between um, allied practices post-World War II and Axis practices post-World War II, and especially, say, why Chiraga's art isn't at all like Joseph Boyce's art, someone who you would think was dealing with very similar issues, who had in many ways a similar kind of a practice. And I would just ask the panelists to explain this really interesting difference between cultural context in Japan and Germany and how this would really influence the kind of art an artist seeking the new would make. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about this downstairs, and I think we need to have a pretty clear understanding of how different the cultural and political climates were in post-war Germany and post-war Japan. Although these are two fascist countries that uh, were allies during World War II, uh, they actually worked very little together, and their reasons for becoming allies were entirely expedient and not necessarily philosophical. Uh, the biggest difference, of course, as we were discussing, is that in Germany, all of the institutions that had been uh, put in place since the rise of Nazism, even going back to the late 1920s, were dissolved and destroyed with Germany's defeat. Not only the infrastructure and the landscape, but also the, um, the political institutions. And the Americans came in and there was a post-war reconstruction era, and Germany was, uh, half of Germany was given the chance to reconstruct along American models with uh, uh, officially, politically, and legally no remnant of the former regime left. That is not the case you have in Japan. You have the main institution, which is the emperor, <laughs> in place with the slight difference that he's no longer divine. Um, but the, the, structure, <laughs> the structure remains in place, um, also, uh, which, which was a choice of MacArthur's, and which was extremely significant because it disallowed the Japanese to uh, actually engage in the kind of reflective guilt, remorse, uh, a historical reckoning that became a national obsession with, within Germany and has never been 
I, public discourse in Japan even in toll today. And so you have um, another difference, which is that Japan was the recipient of the um, atomic bomb, which instantly turned Japan, uh, as it was known at the time, at the time of the bomb dropped, as one of the greatest aggressors in the history of human warfare, with as many as 50 million people dead in the Pacific region. But it instantly overnight became symbolically the victim. Um, so it went from a perpetrator of, of, of atrocity to the victim of atrocity. Uh, and this uh, ambiguity, this, this psychosis that evolved prevented the Japanese from really dealing with their own past. It's something that Takashi Murakami deals with a lot in his work and in his writing. And we feel, I certainly feel, that Gutai arose from that psychic confusion um, where discourse was disallowed and the only way to really process the psychological uh, horrors that they had just experienced on all levels was through the honesty, the brutal honesty of this kind of work. Uh, the, uh, oh, okay. so, uh, continuity is not just the emperor system. Uh, politically speaking, the, uh, like, uh, the core of the government bureaucracy was supplied by the University of Tokyo, and then uh, they studied like Marxism in the 30s and early 40s, and then they knew they were pretty egalitarian type of uh, you know, political ideas, and then that carried over to post-war Japan. Certain departments and agencies were demolished, like, uh, you know, emperor is no longer divine, so like, uh, you don't have the uh, imperial department, but the imperial agency, and then like, uh, there is no, say, special police, there is no military, of course, so like, think some things disappeared, but many things actually continue, and then that was probably part of the success, right? Uh, the reason for success of post-war Japan reconstruction. Another thing, uh, we were talking, and then Kazakhstan brought up, even so, there was a total kind of a, a 180 degree change, mm -hmm. which is educational system. Because as of uh, August 15, 1945, teachers started saying completely different things to elementary school kids. In fact, since the new textbook cannot be made for new term, new semester in September, what they did, the kids did, is they uh, black out all the inappropriate pages or lines <laughs> from their textbook. And that was a part of their uh, <laughs> classes. September 1945, <laughs> three, three weeks after the surrender. So there was, in some sense, yeah. uh, a change, right? The, the, the structures were. Um, maintained, but there was an attempt to think about change. And I think that especially on the left, um, uh, with a lot of novelists who were writing in the Nikutai Bungaku um, strain, which is the literature of the flesh, um, a lot of people were really thinking about, you know, what needs to be done in order to create an individual that could resist totalitarianism in the future. And that this is really very much about um, constructing an individual that can um, make a way forward. Um, what you see very much in Shiraga, especially in his writings about children and also about his art, um, is that he really tries to think about how do we create a situation where people aren't going to follow blindly into the future, right? And that they are able to be creative, that they are thinking for themselves. And this is a really radical way, new way of thinking that also um, permeates uh, these changes in the educational system, especially uh, for, for children. Um, and, and so it, it's really interesting to see here that there's a kind of push and pull um, between you know, this, these um, structures that are not changing, but then there are also, there's also this undercurrent of people who are really trying to figure out something. And I think that's what you're seeing here with Shiraga, that it's not about guilt. It's not about trying to sort of respond to that kind of a call, but it's, it's more about a kind of exorcism of violence. Yeah, that was um, another thing that was so interesting to me is this notion of, of the kind of individuality you need to go forward with these both structures in place and changes. And I guess I was curious in, in two ways. I think many of us are 
perhaps more familiar with a, a French version of existentialism, like um, you know, existence precedes essence or something from Jean Paul Sartre, versus this Japanese notion of what an individual might be. But also that coupled with this real Japanese interest in, in forming groups or collectives where you could have individuals within groups and, and how that would all work. Well, I think that one thing to um, point out in, in terms of the differences between existentialism in France and um, what was happening in Japan is that in, in Europe, the idea was that existentialism um, was saying that humanism had failed, right? Um, how could you have ar architecture after Auschwitz? That, that kind of thinking was um, it, just so important that you know, there could no longer be um, representation. Whereas in Japan, the conclusion was that Japan went to war because there wasn't an adequate level of humanism, that you know, the, the human subject needed to be built. So these are two very different ways of thinking about um, individualism and about humanism and, and how, that, um, how that's built. And also the, uh, the, the, the subjectivity discourse was not so much influenced by the uh, French style Absolutely. existentialism, but the uh, kind of extension of uh, what I'm kind of uh, resistance, the, uh, like Mariama Masao, the main uh, right. philosopher, thinker, had the, uh, was not a prominent person during the war time because of his uh, resistance to the totalitarianism, and he bring forth that idea into the post-war Japan, and he was the main character of the mm -hmm. uh, the discourse, and then that's a part of uh, you know that's a larger framework in which uh, Shiraga's thinking uh, is uh, situated, I think. And then uh, meantime, uh, time and again, say the uh, like his writing about individualism and then like uh, individual quality and so on so forth. That's really the uh, like uh, he might not use existentialism or. Mariama Masao, uh, you know, he didn't say that, but you know, you can be the, uh, you know, kind of intellectual history way, the, uh, you know, the ideas permeating his thinking, you know, and the use of, you know, certain words. Words, yes. Yeah, how does, I'm sorry. Um, well, I, I, I just sort of lost my train of thought. I think it's interesting in uh, the language, shutai, which means a subjectivity, the second character is tai, which is body, as in which of course is also the tai, the body in gutai. And as I think about existentialism, let's say, as a broad cultural phenomenon, if not a particular European philosophy, in the 40s and 50s, in whether you're looking at literature or how it, it, it expressed itself in, in the visual arts, in Europe it remains a very cerebral contemplation. It, it remains still in the realm of ideation. It's still a kind of tied to surreal, surrealism. It's about transcending the body. It's about being above the here and now and, and in, let's say, uh, you know, kind of state of nausea. But in Japan, it's the opposite. The experience of existentialism is entirely embodied. It's entirely uh, uh, within and experienced by the, the flesh. It's, it's about uh, the, the extremism that we uh, see in the Japanese experience of the existential is, is this extremism that is expressed through the physical slaying, the physical fleshiness of the body. That also relates to, unlike the existentialists in France, a real obsession with sex and decadence. And we see that in the, in the novels as well at this time. Um, and where that decadence um, is actually a, a, a place of radical liberation from, again, ideation, from romanticism, from any kind of thought process, because that it was considered that that construction of thought is what uh, comprises modernity, and that modernity and that rationality and the brain and the mind equals progress, and progress brought us the Holocaust and brought us the destruction and devastation of World War II. So it's a profound distrust of the mind, which we don't really see in Europe so much, but in Japan it does, and of course that ties back some people argued, and you see a lot in the discourse, it tied back to a kind of Zen discourse, which also brings a kind of distrust of the mind um, in place of a, a different kind of presence. I think that um, 
I'd like to nuance that a little bit, just in terms of um, the European end of things. Um, you know, in Fautrier, in Dubuffet, you have this kind of um, a return to matter, this return to the body that's quite similar to what I see in um, the engagement with matter in Chiraga. But I think that the key thing to sort of uh, remember is that it, with Shiraga, there's that direct contact. And it, I think that he takes it farther. So, yeah. you know, I think it's, it's, for me, it's more a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. um, this, this sort of engagement yeah. with his body and the sort of distrust of ideology yeah. where, you know, let's face it, all over the world, there is the, this radical sort of rethinking of how do we... Um, proceed as humans um, after understanding that, you know, we're pretty rotten people, you yeah. <laughs> know, um, that there is this sort of radical distrust of, of yeah. ideology, yeah. I think the and, comparison, yeah. of course, to Vols and yes, to Fortre is very important, but I remember in my writing in the Gutai essay, there was somewhere a quote where possibly Shiraga, who says, Fautre and Vols, they're depicting violence, but they're not expressing violence. It's still on a level of it's different. Yeah, absolutely. It's still very French. <laughs> Actually, I, mean, uh, I want to ask uh, Monroe um, in Japanese. Uh, did, you say, did you say that uh, Japanese society denied modernism it, after World War II? I wasn't quite following. We'll get back to that one. It was really interesting to me because I had suggested to the um, experts here that the Chiraga paintings, you know, they didn't really look violent to me. Like, scenes of violence, and this isn't violence. But I turned out to be wrong on that count also. And they had pretty interesting explanations about different nuances between enacting and depicting and what exactly it might have meant um, for Shiraga to think that he was actually being violent in the creation of this art. So <laughs> this敵というよりは闘争的って言った方が、あの、同じかもしれないですけれども、闘争的それとやっぱり自分から外へ出る力というのが、ま、さっきの中に出てると思います。It's not violence per se, but it's more like a fighting spirit. And then the power of the other kind of energy kind of a <laughs> 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 So what we were talking about earlier, um, I'll just bring up the examples just so that you can um, see the sort of uh, what I think of as limit test cases, and then we can also talk a little bit about Matsuki after that. Um, so there are a couple of works that really for, uh, root the works in the 50s um, and even in the, in the early 60s in this discourse of violence. Um, one of them is a work that Shiraga did in 55, I think? Naizo? Naizo? Naizo. Goji 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 Okay, so this was um, a, a bottle that he filled with um, internal organs of a cow um, and then you know it was there was red liquid in it um, and he presented it to Yoshihara Jiro as a work of art and Yoshihara Jiro said to him Damien Hurst that's <laughs> 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 Damien Hurst I'm a tra that it was just too literal for him that it was too grotesque too um, you know yeah, literal. Um, and but but what you can see from that is that the the sort of logic of works um, that he's producing in the fifties and sixties is using red paint, the crimson lake um, of his foot paintings um, is about blood and it's about violence, right there. Yeah, exactly that one. Um, another t um, sort of test case um, is the uh, 1962 uh, wild boar hunting paintings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 
62, 63. Um, they're, they're both in the um, Dallas show. We had one of them in our uh, Guggenheim show, and the other one was in Paul Schimmel's show at the same time. And actually, I had a really interesting conversation with Paul about um, these two wild war hunting paintings, as well as with um, Paul McCarthy last week. Um, as, as I said to Paul, you know, I'm a little more squeamish than Paul McCarthy. <laughs> um, he, and, he and Paul Schimmel love the, um, the work that was in Paul Schimmel's work, uh, show that really you know, takes the literality, uh, the, uh, the literalness of the violence to its ultimate um, point. Um, what this, these two paintings are, are um, boar's hides that are mounted on uh, board, and then he paints on the surface of these boar's hides um, with red uh, paint. Um, and, you know, you have to imagine his toes squishing through this, um, the fur and the, the materiality of what that paint would have felt like. It, was, it would have been bristling and it would have been very sticky, um, just like a wound, right? Um, there's a real sort of bodily um, engagement in these paintings that you uh, that that sort of helps us to understand the violence or how, why we uh, we understand these paintings as being violent that they're, they're sort of these these are the limits um, and then uh, the, the paintings that he's, he's doing on canvas um, are a sort of um, uh, they're, they're, they're related to, the, to these limit test, case, test cases um, but I guess you wanted me to talk about Mud City right that'd be great do, or do you guys want to talk about something else first and then I can I'll, I'll just I'll jump in and make, yeah. make the differentiation that we discussed below and very sure, sure. briefly which is I think when we talk about the violence or the boryoku um, in Shiraga which does not necessarily exist in the works of other Gutai artists it's quite specific to Shiraga it's not violence towards others it's as I was saying it's sort of violence towards the universe it's really violence of the flesh it's violence of of being, but it's not a murderous violence, even if it is the innards of cows. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, I mean yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And also, Sorry. like, uh, the, she gets the uh, best one, but he also we have to remember biographical factor that he was a macho man. Uh, he, he was a macho, as a, as a typical Japanese male at that time, I would say. Uh, he was lovely. Yeah, but that's nothing to do with being a man. <laughs> a man can be very nice person. At the, <laughs> so at the middle school, he was at the, in a club of like a sumo or a swing. And so like, you know, kind of a contact body sport was nothing, you know, very familiar to him. And that's, a, you know, kind of a, you know, a control violence we use in our culture. In our culture, meaning worldwide. You know, it could be ritualistic, you know, in origin, and yeah. which uh, leads to means talk, but the, also it's a control balance. We just, you know, use that, but that's an outlet so that we don't use it anywhere else. As, uh, you know, he, she said, you know, Alexandra said to others. So, like, uh, those things are, you know, really related, mm -hmm. and then, like, uh, not necessarily Shiraga's case is so violent among the Shimamoto breaks the yes. uh, bottle. Yes. And then that's, uh, that's a more obvious violence than uh, yeah. uh, Shiraga's, uh, you it's know, act of attack. Yeah, attack, mm -hmm. and this is not attack. And then mm -hmm. also, so, like, uh, in, in his mind, he could go actually go hunting, carrying a gun. He did. But he couldn't get the uh, prey, so he had to go to a meat shop to get the punchline. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so um, I, I met Shiraga in, I guess it would have been 1996. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is my guitar dad. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, came, it, was, it was on Ashia. After uh -huh. 2000. No, no, it was before that, though. It was, no, you know what it was? Maybe 1998, I think. Yeah. Anyways, um, so, and, uh, you know, we had a long conversation, and one of the topics that we touched upon was this question of violence, which, you know, was very much a part of his work. Oh, and I forgot to mention another sort of limit case, which is, of course, Challenging Mud, which is, you know, on the, on the uh, 
It's the performance that's uh, on the screen in the back there. You can see that he stripped down to his shorts and he jumped into the mud and you know, had a, a, a very um, violent kind of engagement with this mud that gave him uh, you know, cuts and bruises everywhere. Anyways, um, so when we were talking about violence, um, what he brought up was um, the question, not the war, but he brought up um, the experience that he had as a child, or a more of an adolescent, um, of these festivals uh, that he that took place in his hometown of Amagasaki. So in Amagasaki, they have these festivals called Danjiri festivals, which have these huge floats. Um, and by floats, I mean these sort of, um, they're almost like vehicles that they look like um, very small temples, actually. And um, they're pulled through the streets with great violence, and um, they're, they shake, they're supposed to shake in order to manifest the spirit of the gods. Um, these are Shinto festivals. And people stand on top of these floats, and um, as the floats are dragged through the roads, they often will crash into each other. And the people who are standing on top often will fall off, and it's not funny, they die sometimes. Um, and you know, they, they are quite, um, they're quite injured. And it, um, the shop next to his parents' uh, kimono shop was used as a triage space where you know, people would be brought in after they had been injured. And there, what he saw for the very first time as um, a, a child or an adolescent was the, um, he, or what he understood was the effect of violence on the body. And so for him, it was just that experience of violence. Um, and it's through that understanding of violence um, that he sort of worked through and exercised the violence of the war in his painting. So it was a way for him to talk about that kind of violence, and, and the paintings were a way for him to work through that violence. So it, what's interesting, I think, that Alexandra brought up is that it's not a depiction of violence so much as it is an embodiment and a sort of, um, yeah, uh, also, I think it's like a purity, purification of violence. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and then also a kind, a kind of like a festival, that kind of festival is a sancti as a sanctuary, a, a sacred space. Yeah, sacred, the sacred space in which uh, you can, uh, the, and then the violence is sanctioned for that specific purpose. Mm -hmm. And then we can almost transfer that idea onto a canvas. It's a sacred space where Shiraga's violence can be. Or violent gesture, the But again, uh, to to, to uh, again, you know, in, in Judeo Christianity, certain Christianity, violence also has enormous cultural resonance. Mm -hmm. And again, it's it's pain inflicted on Christ. So it is it is the blood. It's that depiction. It's that violence. And it's a sacrifice. This is not about a sacrifice. This is again about pure state of existence. Um, and one thing that I was thinking about downstairs as we were in this tiny room with these enormous paintings screaming at us, um, I, I I recognize that in you. you Somehow, looking at a shulaka, no matter how long, and many of you here live with them, you never see anything. You never see a face. You never see a landscape. So many abstract artists who we live with, we see things. Even, even in a pollock, we can start to see patterns and shifts and nature and mists and lavender mists and blue poles. He gave them titles. He didn't give any of these titles until later. When he did, they were very Buddhist, you know, kind of... Um, concepts. So I, I think that's also something to ponder in our appreciation of this particular kind of abstraction. And it also differentiates it from European abstraction of the same time, which was coming out of surrealism and it was coming out of a very conscious um, uh, use of, of mind and fantasy and ideation to break that apart and then see what other realm the mind and the realm, mind of thought could could conjure. But this is beyond even that. This is in another state. Um, and what what it also occurs to us, I think, when we experience these paintings, is they're really best seen up close. They don't necessarily hold up from a distance. They're made. He's in the space. He's not making them to create a composition. 
He's making them to create an act, and they are relics of this physical act. And that's, that's what they are. And it's that, again, that imprint of the physicality that starts with challenging mud, where the, the mud that's left over after this wrestling is itself a sakuhin, is itself a work, that then disappears. The idea that any of these paintings would survive was entirely outside of Shiraga's initial intention. They were actions. They were expressions. They were this fleshiness. And I think that also brings us to sex, because there's a lot of sex in this, and a lot of fleshiness, and almost a Picasso, you know, the closeness of the body that you see in Picasso's work. It's I've always thought that Picasso's women were making love with your eyes open. If you make your love with eyes open, that's what you see. You see seven eyes and you see six arms. It's actually, an op ophthalmologist once explained it to me, it's pure realism. <laughs> and, and this is sort of a realism too, in that sense. I mean, there is, there is a, there's an enactment that is, that is real and in that reality it's quite pure. Hmm. You mentioned Buddhism and then uh, I think he started using Buddhism Buddhist titles after he gained the uh, monk, uh, uh, lay monkhood. You know, you can be a, pre a monk uh, staying home practicing, you know, your own. Uh, before that, in the 60s, he mainly used the titles in spite of the uh, decree by Yoshihara Jiro, the leader of Bukai, who doesn't like any literary or uh, romantic titles. So, like in often the time, it's called Sakuhin, work or pure untitled. He started using the uh, titles because he had to, uh, kind of mnemonic, you know, you have to remember which work is which because by that, uh, by early 60s, he was creating works for Stadra, some of which are uh, on the wall here and then uh, downstairs, and then like, he took it from a Chinese uh, classic called uh, Water's Margin. Uh, it has the 108 bandits as a pro, uh, protagonist, so you can have 108 titles, which is pretty <laughs> handy actually, then uh, each ti uh, character has uh, specific uh, traits and then like, you know, like a special forte and so on so forth, so like uh, once he names something in the, that specific uh, hero's name, it's, it's, uh, he can remember which painting, you know, he's talking, that painting, it went to Paris, it went to Tokyo, and so on and so forth. And then another names, uh, you know, like a titles we kind of discovered from the back of the paintings, you know, show here is uh, medieval warriors' names. That's another thing he used. Can I just pick up on um, the Suikoden, sure. the, the water margin um, comment that you're making? I think it's a, a really good one. And, and one thing that I find really interesting about him using titles from Suikoden is that this is a story about um, outlaws. It's called The Outlaws of, of, of the Marsh. That's another way of translating the title. Um, and um, it's a, a story about these people who are fighting. It's a brutal story. It's just one sort of you know, um, violent story after the next of people who are fighting against what they think of as an unjust government. Mm. And so, you know, it's, it, they're outlaws, they're bandits, but they're also, they're standing up for something that they believe in, and I think that that's quite significant. Mm -hmm. This, um, I guess you all gather that he became a, a Buddhist monk in the 1970s. So it'd be interesting for me when you think about, say, a 50-year career, if, say, the 1950s paintings are Shinto-influenced in certain ways, the 70s pick up the Buddhist titles and so forth. If we're looking at that long career and we're looking at the paintings, are we seeing differences as a consequence and what differences and how should we look at them differently and, and how do we see that change and progression? And That'd be a good question for Kosei. And also Reiko's written about that. Uh, if you think about it, <laughs> he, he painted by feet, uh, how many years? 50 years, like uh, he uh, started 54, so like 50 years, 60 years. Uh, it's a long time. And then just that, think about it. If you have to do that every day, and you have to be creative, you have to make new things, how could you do that? And in fact, in late 50s, I think, he wanted to quit. Not doing anymore, because there are so many other interesting things he can do. So he said to Yoshihara, I'm quitting food painting, and then uh, the leader said, no, 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 
Happy like your good painting. <laughs> so don't, don't do that. <laughs> and then uh, 59, he said very interesting thing because uh, the, 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 the keep doing it, he understand in the beginning, you know, you can see lots of, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, feet moving around and he, he's very conscious of using feet and then, uh, you know, the dancing around and on the canvas of big paper. But the, uh, by keep doing that, that became the, uh, the, the, the technique itself is less interesting to him. But the, uh, he, it's internalized. So he can be more folks are concerned about the aware of what kind of space, what some kind of line, what kind of colors he's making in the, you know, as a painting. And then that's a, a kind of maturation. Uh, we have to remember, but you know, in the mid 60s, he actually gave up on the painting and then did something else, which didn't work out so well. And then uh, there a few years he didn't paint in the late seven, uh, late 60s into 70, and then he uh, he tried to get the uh, gain the monk food, and it requires training. You have to go to the headquarters of the monk here, which is esoteric Buddhism, not Zen Buddhism. So it's a very different type of training you have to do. It's actually more physical than almost like a, uh, uh, the, 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 the type of Christian uh, monastery food. Sometimes you know you have to really you know throw yourself onto the ground and then uh, you know chant the uh, lots of uh, uh, mantras and then so on so forth. So after that, he got that in the early 70s, and then after that, his practice changed because first thing he do before he even start painting is. Uh, chant the uh, Heart Sutra and then few uh, esoteric Buddhist, Buddhist uh, mantras and then like uh, his mind is calm then and uh, he feel as though he can leave it all to the Buddha and then that's a different mindset than yes let's paint uh, or oh, let me paint and then so on so forth so that's an interesting change uh, biographically speaking those. <laughs> <laughs> so we Japanese again. <laughs> uh, so in the 70s, it's not as though he stopped painting entirely. Uh, he painted uh, images of Buddha and he uh, painted circles using um, sumi ink. And then it was in the 80s again that he started to paint with his, went back to painting with his feet. And he hadn't done it for a while, and so he was concerned. But once he got back into it, you know, it's like riding a bike or skiing. If you've done it and you know how, your body remembers how to do that. Um, but what he did do um, after that period is that he would uh, give a Buddhist prayer. And in the 90s, he had images in mind. Uh, some of the works upstairs, the Pungyu, right, Raising Bull. Uh, that, uh, so, so there was an image in mind. Uh, as he did the work. The older works, the idea was to achieve nothingness. Um, I think that's the reverse of what one usually does when we're living. But um, late in his life, he told me that one time he saw a woman with quite a face, and so that was something that he had in mind when he did that particular painting. <laughs> I, I just want to add yeah. one thing that's very important for us. We say he was ordained as a Buddhist monk. He was actually ordained as a Tendai Buddhist monk, which is basically equivalent to being ordained as a Russian Orthodox priest. I mean, this is the most... Um, ritualistic, the, we call it esoteric Buddhism. It was the earliest Buddhism to come into Japan. It was the court Buddhism of 
the Heian period. Mm -hmm. um, it was not the reform Buddhism that Zen becomes. Mm -hmm. So it's not Protestantism, it's <laughs> high church. And it would be interesting, and I've, I've, I've you know, not done research on this, my colleagues have, how and why uh, he was attracted to this. The other esoteric form of Buddhism in Japan that's extremely well known, of course, is Shingon, which actually even came later. So Tendai is, there's something very primitive, very Japanese, comes from China, of course, via uh, uh, the Himalayas, but um, there's something kind of, uh, I mean, I'm guessing here, but there's something kind of atavistic and prehistoric and pre-modern in that. Zen is too modern for him. <laughs> the question is why he went to Hiezan and not Koyasan. And the answer was that Hiezan is the place where uh, this Buddhist practice could take place. That means Hiezan, Mount Hie is the headquarter of Tendai, and then Mount Koya is headquarter of Shingo. So my, I, my question to him is why not Mount Hie and then Mount Koya? Mount Hie is actually north of uh, Kyoto. Uh, Mount Koya is uh, south of Osaka. So Mount Hie is actually close to Kyoto. <laughs> Maybe. Sorry, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's Sorry. Easy, it was easy convenient. Way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, let's thank our panelists. That was really fabulous. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.